institutions in the United States. So HBCUs were created to provide the Black community with skills and education and trades that would improve the quality of their lives. Um, since that time, uh, HBCUs have grown in both funding and in size. Um, there are more than 100 historically Black colleges and universities across the South, East Coast, and Midwest United States. And today, they welcome students from all races and ethnic backgrounds, and they still play a, a vital role in educating future Black leaders and professionals. Um, just for a few examples, HBCUs continue to encourage the growth of African Americans in, in STEM subjects. We, we call STEM, uh, STEM is also an acronym that stands for like science and technology fields. Um, since the early 2000s, 24% of Black STEM graduates in the U.S. have earned their degrees from HBCUs. Uh, and as of September 2021, according to the Department of Education's report, 75% of all Black Americans holding a doctorate degree, 75% of all Black officers in the armed forces, and 80% of all Black federal judges received HBCU education um, or training. So if you've heard of a few of these famous individuals that I'm going to name shortly, uh, you may not know that they all went to historically Black colleges and universities. A few uh, individuals of note include Dr. Martin Luther King, who went to Morehouse College. Um, Vice President Kamala Harris is also a graduate of an HBCU. Uh, for the film enthusiast, Spike Lee uh, went to an HBCU. Toni Morrison, the writer, um, actor and producer Samuel L. Jackson, and media mogul Oprah Winfrey. They all were educated at historically Black colleges in the United, in the United States. Um, so today, in honor of Black History Month, which the United States celebrates every February in order to acknowledge the contributions that African Americans make to the United States and the continued contributions that they will make acknowledging what they will do in the future, we want to discuss historically Black colleges and universities. Um, today, you'll hear personal experiences from the panelists, as I mentioned, uh, and just in general, and specifically, HBCUs offer a very unique experience because they offer students something that they can't get anywhere else. And that is a diverse and inclusive community of academic excellence that celebrates the richness of the entire American experience. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have four esteemed panelists joining us here today, all with various backgrounds and experiences. Um, let me get to my bios. All right, so first we have um, Melissa Deschamps. Um, Melissa is a Regional Educational Advising Coordinator with Education USA. It's an organization uh, that helps support students that want to study in the United States. Uh, she's based here in Doha. Uh, she manages a dynamic portfolio of centers covering 13 countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in the field of international education as she's worked in nonprofit, university, and governmental settings. Uh, throughout Melissa's career, she has facilitated intercultural learning experiences, developed educational programs, managed exchange opportunities, and worked with both students and professionals in an advisory capacity. Melissa completed her education in the United States, earning a bachelor's degree in communication from Seton Hall University and a master's in international education from NYU. Uh, Melissa, do you want to come on the screen and just give everyone a wave really quick before I move on to introducing our next panelist? Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Melissa. Happy to be here. Looking forward to questions and discussion coming up. Beautiful. Thanks, Melissa. So next up, we have Dr. Uh, Aaron Jones. Dr. Aaron was inspired by human potential. Uh, Dr. Aaron looks to environmental factors Oh, sorry, I have a delay, so I just heard Melissa. Um, so Dr. Aaron uh, is inspired by um, environmental factors that encourage or inhibit one's ability to reach their potential. Um, the quest to learn and understand more has resulted in him excelling in team sports. He earned a Division I scholarship. He can tell you what that means. Um, he earned a bachelor's, a master's, and doctoral degrees centering on human thought, human development, human behavior, and human learning. Dr. Jones leans on those experiences and knowledge when supporting student mental health, 
watching them catch glimpses of their greatness in the university application process, speaking and publishing articles in professional literature and conferences, and sitting on university advisory boards. Dr. Aaron also serves as one of the equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice curriculum coaches at the American School of Doha. In this role, he is charged with ensuring the curriculum is socially and emotionally safe and reflective of the many identities present within the American School of Doha community. Additionally, Dr. Aaron serves as a university professor teaching masters and doctoral students. This summer, Dr. Jones will have the opportunity to give a guest lecture at the Universidad del Pacifico in Lima, Peru, where he will be discussing global education. Uh, Dr. Aaron, is that still the case or was that put off due to COVID. If you want to jump on the screen and give us a little wave and introduction. Everybody, um, happy to be here as well. A great occasion. Um, happy Black History Month to all. Yes, as of right now, everything's a go. Been on my Duolingo, practicing my Spanish. So let's go. All right, thank you, Dr. Aaron Jones. I'm going to pause because I think there's a delay. Let me just wait for a moment. Great, beautiful. Excited to hear that that's still on. Um, and I'm also practicing Spanish every day on Duolingo, so more power to you. Um, next, I'd like to do, introduce Amy Grant. Um, Amy Grant Duncan currently resides in Doha. She's serving as the brand and communication lead for Vodafone Qatar. Uh, Amy is an executive level global marketing strategist specializing in developing brand strategy and marketing communications. Amy's career in the telecommunications industry has spanned 20 years. Prior to joining Vodafone and Qatar in June 2021, Amy Grant served in a variety of senior marketing roles at Verizon in the United States and as the global head of brand and communications at Digicel Caribbean Limited in St. Lucia, West Indies where she oversaw the global brand strategy for, digi for Digicel's 32 markets in the Caribbean, Central America, and South Pacific. Amy hails from Inglewood, New Jersey, and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in History from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, with a Master's of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Amy has always had a love of travel, learning about new cultures, and excited about experiencing this new chapter in the Middle East with her husband, Kevin. Amy, uh, Grant Duncan, would you like to hop on and give us a wave and mention anything else I might have missed? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and the ability to take part in this lovely panel. I'm excited to talk about my experience at Spelman. I am a 100% advocate for um, the HBCU matriculation. It has been defining in my life. And I'm just excited to be here to meet all of you and, and talk further about this. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Um, so last but certainly not least, uh, we have Russell Edmonds. Uh, Russell Edmonds is actually a recent graduate of the American School of Doha, um, ASD class of 2017, and a recent graduate of an HBCU in the United States, Howard University class of 2021, uh, where he earned a degree in mechanical engineering. So Russell Edmonds is a native of Northern Virginia by way of Houston, Texas. In 2015, he moved to Doha, where he was a student at the American School of Doha, otherwise known as ASD. At ASD, Russell played volleyball, basketball, and baseball, and took advantage of the school's AP course curriculum. Following high school, Russell enrolled at Howard University in Washington, DC on a full expense paid academic scholarship to study mechanical engineering. Congratulations, Russell. Uh, while at Howard, he served as president of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, Alpha Chapter, and in the executive cabinet for the Howard University Student Association. 
He also served as a site coordinator for the Howard University Alternative Spring Break Program, which sends students to dozens of sites globally to fulfill impactful community service initiatives. While at Howard, Russell also completed internships with Stanford University, ExxonMobil, and the U.S. House of Representatives. In May 2021, Russell graduated magna cum laude from Howard. Later that year, he moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and began work with AT&T in their technology development program. In his free time, Russell enjoys reading, traveling, and exploring Atlanta with his friends. Russell, do you want to hop on and get everyone a wave? Uh, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Happy Black History Month. I'm uh, excited for the opportunity to talk about Howard. And um, God forgive me if I reach for my tea. It's 8 in the morning here in Georgia, so uh, we're fighting to stay awake. Completely understandable. Thank you so much for waking up early and joining us today. Um, and before I jump into the questions, I just want to thank all of our panelists for being here with us today, understanding that you are in different time zones and different places in your lives. Thank you for making time to participate in this important panel. And thank you to ASD uh, and Yahaira for helping us organize this, as well as Education USA for taking part in the panel. Uh, thank you to Dr. Amy Walker for helping to coordinate this as well. So just a big thanks for everyone that took part in making this a great success as it already is kicking off as one. So with that being said, I want to jump into the questions. Um, this first portion is free flowing. So I'm going to pose a question and any of the panelists are free to answer. If you feel as though you have something to contribute, please join and share your experience or your insight. And then a second portion of the questions include pointed questions for specific panelists. Uh, so for starters, I'm just going to pose a question. Uh, why study at an HBCU? Uh, anyone feel free to weigh in on that. Um, I could start. Um, I, I think the reason to study, and you mentioned it earlier in your intro, I look at it at the perfect intersection of an, uh, the ability to build confidence to build awareness and also to experience excellence with respect to education. Um, I went to Spelman, um, I'm a class of 1994. So I uh, started um, at Spelman towards the tail end of the eighties. Um, that was a time when a uh, different world was on you know, the screen, the Cosby show, um, I went to uh, a predominantly black high school in Englewood, New Jersey. And at the time, a lot of communities were experiencing what they call white flight. So as um, communities became more of color, you saw uh, uh, people of Caucasian or whites moving out. So there were certain connotations about being in a predominantly black setting or of color setting, which I experienced. Um, I was a top um, person in my class, but I would often get into situations that were mixed where there was a thought that, well, you might be top, but you're top in a predominantly black um, high school. So maybe you're not as good. Going to an historically black college helped me to understand and see a sea of black women. Uh, Spelman's class usually ranges to about 20, 2100, 200, um, 2700 women. And to see women, black women, not monolithic, excel across all different um, uh, areas of education, math, science, history, uh, economics, it helps to reinforce that confidence that, you know what, I am, we are just as good. It also, there is a certain focus on education from um, understanding who you are, your history, and even what's happening now with the whole debate of um, critical race theory, you know, that's pretty much non-existent. 
um, in that setting. And then it's just to see the, the camaraderie, the socialization, it helps you to become excellent in so many spheres. So for me, it was a no brainer at that time. You know, I knew I wanted to go to historically black college. And in fact, my guidance counselor was asking me to apply to the Ivies. And I knew like Spelman was my top choice. Spelman, Howard Hampton, those were the three. Um, and my brother actually um, had been accepted to Morehouse um, two years earlier. And when I had the opportunity then to visit Spelman and I was sold. So, um, and that was my reason I applied early admission. Once I had gotten in, that was it, I was done. And I was so happy to be a part of that class. And, you know, those classmates that I, um, you know, went through Spelman with are my friends to this day. They're part of what I would call current history. You know, I was in school with Stacey Abrams. She was the class behind me. I look at some of my other classmates who are even at Morehouse who are now dean, a dean of social work at NYU. I have another classmate who is, um, and I call the AUC, that's part of as my classmate class of 94, who's the global head of investors at Blackstone Group. So again, it just was a, a, a area, a Petri dish to just grow um, excellence and understanding. So that was one of the reasons why I, decided to attend an HBCU and was fortunate that I was able to get in. Beautiful, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Aaron, did you wanna say something? Sure, um, I didn't have an opportunity to attend an HBCU, unfortunately. I think my, when I was a, a young person looking off to university, my experience was uh, more ordered by athletics. I was looking to play professional sports. So I wanted an opportunity to go to a school where I was gonna get exposure to uh, these big uh, broadcasting opportunities I wanted to play on ESPN. Um, and at the time, um, in the early 2000s, the, the HBCUs were only on TV one weekend. That was for the, the Southern Classic. Um, things have changed tremendously now. It's, it's a completely different world to be an athlete um, in the 20 teens um, and into the 2020s. Um, but at that point in time, I really wanted to, to, to go and play uh, Division I sports as I did. I played football. But I was very curious um, about the HBCUs. One of the things that's really, really big in Pennsylvania is the Black College Tour. I was able to hop on a bus and drive from Pennsylvania all the way down to Florida and see pretty much every school on the East Coast over two weeks. It's some of the best memories that I have to this day on the bus, traveling through um, starting through Pennsylvania to see Lincoln and Cheney down to the DMV, Morgan, Howard, to the Virginias, Virginia State and Norfolk State and Hampton, all the way up through Tennessee State and Fisk. It was just an amazing time to see, um, for me as, as a young man, to see the girls on the yard step in and hollering and going in the classroom and, and seeing Black professors um, was something I'd never seen. Even though I'm from a black part of town, I never had a black teacher. So the idea to have a black university professor was a completely foreign concept to me. And that's something that I want for all the students that I have an opportunity to, to work with. I've worked professionally um, in well-resourced private schools where I haven't had uh, many black students be the majority. So my conversations with them are always about what, what would it might it feel like for you to be not the only one to be a part of the majority for a time. Have you ever had a black teacher? Most of them have said no. Um, what would that be like for them? So no, I didn't get to attend, but I wish um, for my kids to have that experience if they so choose. And anyone who has had that experience, uh, I 
I'm always keen to hear the stories because there's always some good laughs. And as my, my panelist has shared, uh, Ms. Amy, yeah, that my friends who did go to HBCs, they've gone off to do amazing things in every industry. Um, so shout out to them. Happy to be here to contribute from the PWI perspective, I suppose. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, and I understand that I am experiencing a significant delay. So Dr. Amy Walker is going to continue with questions until I can troubleshoot, uh, but I'll ask one more question before she jumps on. Um, what is different about the HBCU experience? How is it unique from studying at a predominantly white institution? I can, uh, I can start trying to take a stab at that one. Um, I'll think first and foremost, I know it was kind of mentioned that, you know, a lot of students, their upbringing, they don't have um, black teachers or people around them to, to kind of bring them up coming, you know, while they're growing up. Um, that was my experience. I never had one black teacher all throughout K through 12, um, all coming up. But my first semester at Howard, of course, all my professors are black. So it was a complete 180 um, in an experience. and not only in seeing representation in the people that are um, teaching and, and helping you grow, um, but also in the sense that, you know, learning about Black history, knowing about where you come from, knowing about the uh, diaspora of Black people around the world is kind of the status quo at HBCU. So um, you can't leave campus without having a more confidence in yourself as a Black person, because that's just kind of the, the, the bar where the bar is set and the expectation. Um, and not to mention the fact that I think a lot of HBCUs have um, required courses on Black studies. So you're you're going to leave campus knowing where you come from um, in a lot of different ways. While we fix our technical difficulties, anyone else want to take a stab at that? I know, Amy, you may have something to add. And I'm actually going to also ask Ms. Jahida if she has anything to add since she, since she too went to an HBCU. Hi, everyone. Just like I put on the spot. <laughs> I was going to let Amy answer that, but it's OK. Um, I mean, to kind of echo what Russell uh, mentioned, um, I think most HBCUs also have very diverse faculty too. And so you get exposed to the entire diasporic, you know, possibilities in terms of um, who is teaching you. Um, but ultimately for me, I think that what was, um, the most important is the that burning question of, did I really get a C on that paper because it was a C paper or was it because the professor is not really sure about my potential or is kind of, if, is there any form of bias in the grade that I'm receiving? Because I've experienced that before. And so to me, I, it was really comforting to know that if I get a C, my paper was probably terrible, um, <laughs> or it was a C paper, you know, like, um, and so, and then there was also, um, you know, a level of comfort too, um, that felt great in terms of asking for help. Uh, there was just always a sense of familiarity with, with the faculty as well. 
um, that I think was amazing um, during my experience. But but also, like I mentioned, in terms of things being diasporic, it was great to see Black people and people of color in general from all over the world in one space um, and kind of going past just seeing someone knowing they're black but then finding out more about them knowing a little bit more about where they come from um, and being exposed to so many different people at the same time so in some senses it's also a little bit similar in to the idealism that international schools um, have abroad and you know you could have classmates at a school um, here in Qatar in a, in a high school from you know 30 or 40 different places the same is actually true at an HBCU and so um, I think that that is definitely one of the things I enjoy the most during my experience yes I would echo all of that um, because I remember for me you know my focus has always been on the art side of things. And, you know, I felt like stereotypically that it often happens with females that you don't think they're as good in math or science. And, you know, my college roommate, you know, one of the, she majored in math, went on to, you know, get masters in public health and to see the brain she was in math, you know, already dispelled some of those stereotypes or those insecurities that you might bring to the table, whether it's with gender, whether it's with race. So to see, again, the spread of students that are your peers, not only helps to reinforce what you could do, but it also allows you to operate on a level. You know, you want to keep up with the people that are surrounding you. Um, and that was something that was very true. Another added benefit, which um, you don't realize at the time is, you know, um, because of the dynamic in the United States, um, when you look at post-grad, you, when you're looking for jobs, when you're looking to go to graduate school, you know, you'll often find corporations trying to zero in on places where they could have such a, a, a big pool of talent to make sure that their, um, their workforce are, is as diverse and as inclusive as possible. So you found out that you, know, you were in places where the corporations were going to go in terms of recruitment, right? They were going to have the top HBCUs on their list. So you were in a great place to not only while you're in school, um, get the type of education and overall just um, uh, well-roundedness from a social community service standpoint, um, but you were also in a great place when it came to post-grad, whether you were going on to medical school, law school, or to get a job. Um, and I was also on the other side of that when I was employed to say, this is where you need to go. So I think that's something else to realize, you know, as you think about that overall e experience of, of, of why you want to go. And you don't really think about that when you're entering as a freshman, but, you know, it is important to consider all that. I think as Dr. Jones was saying from a football standpoint, that's what he wanted to do. Um, outside of that, you know, that's something that I don't, people sometimes feel like if I go to an HBCU, I'm not going to be able to compete with those who are at PWIs or IVs. But I think that's a misconception, you know, because I know personally that institutions, corporations are going to those schools because they know that just even for, you know, the amount of students that they would be able to see because of a recruitment visit, it makes sense to go to the HBCUs where you have numbers. So I think that's one thing that I, I like to reinforce because as people are considering whether they go to an HBCU or a PWI, there's often the, the perception that you're giving something up because you are going to an HBCU. And I'm here to say that that's absolutely not the case. Um, 
and and things have changed since I was in school. You know, I'm I'm approaching my uh, 30 year uh, reunion, um, but it it is something that I think it, it I, I need to keep saying that because. Um, I don't want students who are considering an HBU experience to think that this is something that if I go, I might get the, I might be surrounded in what could be considered utopia for some if they've never really been surrounded by their uh, people like them. But from just overall, another aspect of where you want to go into your career, you're not giving up anything. Thank you. And I am speaking right to you, Amy. Um, you have a unique experience where you went to an all women's college, Spelman College. And we're curious to know, how did you choose Spelman? Um, great, great question. Um, I have to say I had a little help um, because at that time, you know, um, as I said, a different world was on, you know, the screen. And Hillman College, if you, everyone doesn't know, is really um, the campus and everything. You, every, all the visuals are is Spelman, um, and so that was something that always piqued my interest. I don't know why that was a part of it, but I, I was just always drawn to an HBCU. Like I'd never really considered a PWI, but Spelman at the time I knew that was the place where top women got educated, you know? And I wanted to be, I considered myself a top student and I wanted to be surrounded by excellence. And that is why I chose Spelman. And when I had the opportunity to visit Spelman before I actually was accepted, I mean, it did not fail me, you know? I saw women like myself, um, the type of um, displays they did, whether they had to present, whether it was um, what, where they were interning, um, the type of grades they had gotten. I was just in awe, you know, and I wanted to be as good as those Spelman women. Um, also, some people get afraid because it's all an all women's college. Why do I want to be around an all women's college? I'll have to say I knew Spelman was a part of the AUC. So I knew Morehouse College was literally across the street. I knew Clark Atlanta University, Morris Brown. So it even though it was an all women's college, you did not you, you did not feel like you were in a, a situation where you were just around all women. So again, it was the best of, of both worlds. And then Spelman, there's been two themes in my life. Um, I was always interested in different cultures. I was always interested in um, what was, um, you know, out, outside of my neighborhood. And Spelman had a really good study abroad program. And um, I made sure during my junior year that I studied abroad because I had studied abroad in high school and I wanted to continue that. And so that was another reason why I was able from an international standpoint to you know, have that focus. So again, like I said, you don't give anything up. And I also encourage anyone who goes to um, college to have that study abroad experience, whether it's domestically or internationally, because again, it allows you to see um, another experience and see how you, um, and you just, you gain from that regardless. So that was another reason why I, I picked Spelman. Howard was again, like if I didn't get to Spelman, I knew it was gonna be Howard. But I also like, because I came from New Jersey, Spelman was far enough, you know, at the time, if you were going to a historically black college in New Jersey, in my town, you were either going to Howard or Hampton. Um, and because it was close, like uh, Howard is only four hours away, DC from New Jersey and uh, Hampton is seven. By car, Spelman was 16 hours. And I wanted to have an experience that was very different from where I grew up. I did not want to have an, like a, a fifth year of high school. You know, I really wanted a new experience. So that was another reason why Spelman was so attractive to me because it was far enough that it allowed me to really 
blossom and have a completely new experience. So that was another reason why I chose Spelman. Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Amy Grant Duncan. I really appreciate Dr. Amy for stepping in while I was managing those technical difficulties. I'm back online. Here we are two years into COVID and I still can't manage Zoom meetings, but sorry, it's okay. So speaking of Howard um, and the university experience, I'm going to pose a question to Russell. Uh, Russell, what made you to decide? What made you decide to attend Howard University? Uh, what was that experience of choosing a university like for you, and, and how was it unique? Uh, that's actually a funny question. Um, so I was applying to Howard in in 2016, and at the time, it was kind of before the big push for HBCUs and people to um, start applying there. But um, I think my class particularly was was right when the political climate in the U.S. is was kind of changing. This is 2016. So um, I know my class was was a big push. We're like the largest class in the university's history because of the, the tides were changing across the country. Um, but even still, Howard was maybe when my in my top five when I was applying to schools. Um, I think it was some amount of divine intervention and um, me getting a scholarship to go to Howard where I was like, maybe I'll uh, maybe that's actually a good idea to try to go to the school for uh, for free to college for free. So um, despite that, you know, I was kind of unsure when I got to campus, but within a month, I completely understood that's exactly where I needed to be. Um, my sister uh, will, will gripe my first semester when I came back um, in December. She was like, you wouldn't shut up about Howard. Everything, every day was something Howard. Oh, yeah, they went to Howard. Someone said went to Howard. Like, um, so that, that's one of those things where any just stepping foot on, on an HBCU campus is something special and getting to go for four years is even more so because uh, you know, Howard is the Mecca. I mean, you, you literally cannot walk two feet without seeing a Howard alum um, anywhere in the world or seeing something that Howard influenced uh, across the Black culture, across the diaspora. So um, it's definitely, definitely great, you know, shameless plug for Howard, definitely a great place to, uh, to study. Also, I'm happy to hear um, me harassing you on the <laughs> campus didn't make the list. <laughs> And of course, the Howard alum that pushed me to go as well. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> and then Russell, if I can follow up, how do you think Howard prepared you for life after college? I mean, you mentioned this 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 legacy that spans across the globe, but how do you feel like it specifically prepared you and your journey uh, for it? especially being a recent grad? You know, what what was that process like for you? Um, I'd say the first thing that comes to mind is just a level of confidence. Um, and I've shared, like, I've even discussed that with my um, peers that graduated with me. Um, I feel comfortable in pretty much any room. Um, and I don't think that's the case for a lot of people coming out of college. I think there's some sort of confidence you get out of being sure in your Blackness and in yourself that you get at an HBCU that you um, may not necessarily get uh, at another institution. And uh, me and my peers, we, we, we've discussed, like, yeah, I, I'm in meetings and able to make things move quicker than a lot of my um uh, peers are able to get um, to get done. And another thing that that comes to mind is um, it's not just the university you went to, it's the entire HBCU collective. So um, even now it's I'm in my first um, seven months in working and um, most of my mentors are HBCU alum that um, didn't go to Howard. A lot of them went to Clark Atlanta, which I had never been to, you know, of course I knew about it, but um, a lot of the people that have really showed me the ropes uh, working professionally have been alum from other HBCUs. So I've really um, appreciated the fact that you get you get to tap into over a hundred institutions that are essentially family, not just your one HBCU that you choose, which is a great experience as well. Yeah, that's beautiful. And thank you. Um, so now I have a question, uh, Melissa, if I can direct the discussion towards you and in, in your role as, sure. as, as a facilitator, as a REAC. Um, how can these students prepare to study at institutions in the United States, specifically HBCUs? So, I mean, we've heard excellent examples of what drove people to choose the institutions that they ended up in. And that's really the first step, uh, which is, what is it that you want out of an experience? The academics certainly are important, but not all students coming out of high school have a clear idea of the exact major that they wanna study or what exactly they wanna do. So while that's part of it, 
you're also living your student life there. And so whether it's sports, whether it's internships, whether it's leadership opportunities, um, the opportunities for research, you have to think about what you might wanna explore and learn about and engage in so that when you're looking at different institutions, you're factoring those things in and not just searching for an institution by name, which we often see in this region, um, but you're looking at what can I provide in, in the experience on campus and what can I gain from that as well? You really wanna push yourself, you wanna learn. So it's really about researching all of those different areas that you would want to take a look at, um, be a part of and push yourself in, in that way as well. We have you know, over 4,000 institutions, accredited colleges and universities in the US. So it's really about finding the right fit and not just going somewhere because your friend or your family member went there or somebody told you, but really finding something that connects you to that institution and making sure that you're gonna thrive there um, and enjoy the experience. So again, just researching and, and taking a look at yourself. I think that you have to start from that place as well. Um, knowing yourself, what kind of classes, you know, how big should the classes be for you to really do well? Do you not do well in, in a freezing cold environment? So if the winter comes around, are you gonna be, you know, missing out on your classes and sleeping in because it's too cold and snowy? Uh, you wanna think about all of those things. And then obviously then taking your time to figure out what those options are including HBCUs, including minority serving institutions such as MSIs, looking at non-traditional pathways like community colleges and a two plus two program. So that really it's about you finding that personalized experience that will have you coming out on the other side, ready to be confident, ready to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. Um, I, it's very easy when you're in high school to think about studying at one of your dream institutions. I was one of those people. And then I looked at their majors and I was like, oh, wait, I don't want to study any of these things. And I'm not good at economics. I have to do this many economic courses. So it's incredibly helpful to do the research. Um, yeah. Speaking of research, what kind of resources does Education USA offer for students who are starting the process of looking into schools? How, how can you guys support students that are in that position? Yeah, so Education USA, um, as you briefly mentioned, it's, it's a broad network, it's a US State Department network. So whether you're in Doha, Qatar, or anywhere in the world, um, you have access to advisors who are prepared to work with you and you know, guide you through the process along the way, you and or your parents or school counselors who have questions. So we have sessions like this um, where we partner with others and make sure we're really, we're really the official source of information. Uh, we wanna make sure that students are looking at reliable information. And so that's kind of the, the key area we wanna focus on. We're not pushing any specific institution or type of institution. We're really just trying to help students navigate through what seems like a very um, complex uh, process, but really it's a very individualized process. And so we have one-on-one -on -one advising services um, at any stage. Our Education USA advisors divide up the process in what would be five steps. And so we see where, you're, where you are in the process. You can come to an EDUSA advisor at any part of the process for any part of the process. You're not committed to continue. Um, you're not tied to anything. Um, but we have guides online. We have um, cohort advising groups where we have students who are going through the process who can rely on one another, have opportunities for further developing their skills in writing personal statements, preparing for any entrance exams, um, interview skills, looking at, you know, if they're working on brag sheets and looking at what their experience has been like in high school or whether it's an undergrad going for graduate studies, how do you present yourself effectively? And having that external set of eyes to look at that and say, only someone who really knows you might get these nuances. How can you explain that better for an admissions committee. So really it's just here to help clarify questions and provide support um, throughout. And of course, they're all free services. I know that's one of the key questions students usually wanna know, how much is it gonna cost me? 
Um, but again, we also have resources through US institutions. And so we oftentimes host information sessions with them um, to talk about specific key topics that we get a lot of questions on, like how do I finance my studies? You know, Are there scholarships available? Can I work while I'm in the US? Uh, and we have those admissions officers and those recruitment officers talk directly with the students. Um, we also offer university fairs. We have one coming up next month. Students will have a chance to speak with over 60 US universities and really you know, ask your questions. That's what these US university reps are there for. So um, here in Doha, the advisors are based at the embassy. And so you know, reaching out through social media, through email, um, attending these sessions are the best way to connect with them. Thank you. I like to think of Education okay. USA as like a one-stop shop for all yes. student needs. So your yeah. explanation was 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 perfect. And as you mentioned, Great. we are available to answer any questions here at the embassy. So please reach out. Um, speaking of advising, Dr. Aaron, I'd like to hear from you about your experience. Uh, do you find that students are interested in HBCUs? Do you think that this climate is changing in terms of a greater awareness or, or are there some gaps? I think the tides are changing. Um, university admission is changing. Um, these young people are speaking out um, and they're voting with their wallet. They are walking the walk and talking the talk as it relates to um, equity for women, of course, and job satisfaction. And I think the same is true for their education. Um, so when I was looking into schools, like I said, I wanted to play sports, um, but you've been seeing a, a resurgence of the HBCUs on the athletic fields. North Carolina A&T, uh, which is a wonderful school down in North Carolina, is ranked number one in track and field in all sports. Um, down in Jackson State, um, Deion Sanders is the head coach. He has one of the top recruiting classes. He's sealed uh, a huge endorsement deal from Under Armour that has redone the weight room and all those things that are the bells and whistles for the athletes that, that are interesting for them. So now is the time for, like I said, for young people to have an experience that is tilted towards their experiences and it views problems through the lens of black and brown people, which is an experience that is completely foreign, especially to these international students that I've been working with. Um, I had a, a, a set of twins a couple of years ago um, who had never heard of the term HBCU. They didn't know it existed. Um, and being able to have that conversation with them, seeing their eyes light up about this experience for them. Um, one of the things we talk a lot about is this idea of being a third culture kid and looking for an anchor in their identity. And so for to have a university experience that is geared towards grounding and giving them that sense of identity, that sense of courage that uh, Russell talked about is remarkable um, for these young people. Um, the thing that I think is interesting, though, um, in the international context is this idea of prestige that has been touched on by my other panelists. Um, there's a really interesting podcast um, that I will put in the chat if that's okay. Um, it is, um, I figured it might come up and here's my, my plug for it. Um, it is uh, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast called Revisionist History. Um, it's a two-part um, sort of deal on this one. So this is part two. You might want to listen to part one first, but it's about the ranking system um, and the flaw and the methodology behind these ranking bodies. The episode that I just shared talks about Dillard, which is a great school down in New Orleans. Um, and it talks about if the ranking system was lacking one part of it, it's the peer ranking portion of it. If that part was ranking, Dillard would shoot up like into the top 10 um, based on its other academic sort of reputation, the quality of its professors, where people are getting jobs, all the things that should matter in rankings. Um, so it's a really interesting listen for, for those who are here to sort of get at, again, the quality of education, the excellence that's already been mentioned, um, and really get rid of the fluff um, that comes with a lot of those um, advising bodies and, and their methodology, at least. Yeah, absolutely. 1000% uh, agree. Meanwhile, I see that you've immortalized your jersey behind you. Is that? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, so 
I am a football, I come from a football family. My my grandfather was one of the first black football players at Purdue University, oh, and uh, his son went and played. And so I'm I'm the third. Um, so it's 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 it was a rites of passage to to go and and play football. And as a young person, all I cared about was scoring touchdowns. So that's uh, where it's taken me. <laughs> okay, okay. So were you running back then? What? And the way you could score it, I did it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. And that's a that's an amazing legacy that you and your and your father and your grandfather have. That's beautiful. Thanks. Um, perfect. So that is all I have in terms of organized questions. There are a few questions in the chat that um, attendees have asked. Um, if there's anything else that panelists would like to add before I move into the open question and answer session, please let me know or hop on now. If there's anything that I didn't cover in questions that you think would be important to share, this is the time. Uh, if not, I will hop right into the, 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 the questions in the chat. Morgan, I just wanted to add one more thing just in terms of the awareness level of students um, for HBCUs. As um, Aaron said, it is growing. And if we look at Maybe 25 years ago, the international student enrollment at HBCUs was at or just under 15%. And just in the last five years, now one in four students. So about 25% of um, students at HBCUs are international students. So it is something that um, we're seeing an increased awareness of and interest in. But again, it comes with um, having more students that represent the, the students we're working with. So as international students see their fellow students in the US at those campuses sharing their experiences, that can only um, make that interest and awareness grow because it really is when they can see themselves in the alums, in the current students, um, that goes a lot farther most of the time than just those of us kind of in the field telling them, this is a great place, these are great options. Um, but they see their classmates um, attending and, and it changes the dynamic. So we're definitely seeing an uptick on that. I, I kind of want to piggyback off of that because I think it's a good point for international students. Because um, I think my, my experience at Howard in the College of Engineering I think we're just shy at 50%. I think it's about 45% international students. Um, so even, you know, for me, like my senior project design team, we're we're virtual because, you know, because of the pandemic and we're spread across four time zones. Uh, we have people, first generation Americans in California and we have people in Trinidad and Tobago because it's a very international uh, experience. Even our professor is not American. So um, you're, you would not be the only international student at an HBCU by any means or stretch. Um, and there are lots of resources for international students. There is, I know we have the Caribbean Student Association, uh, African Student Association, East African Student Association. Like there's, there's something for everyone to find their, their, their niche. Uh, there was a point I kind of wish I was an international student. It looked like they were having so much fun at their events. But um, you, you definitely would not be out of place or the only international student at an HBC by, by any means. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and, and Russell, you can just keep the mic is hot because we've got a lot of questions for you. Um, so first of all, uh, students are interested in your scholarship experience. How did you get your scholarship? What is that process like? Where can you find those resources? Was it difficult? You know, what, what, what was that like for you? And how can they get a full ride? Right. Um, I'll say at, at Howard for um, of course, the different scholarships, you can get those through the university. So that's merit or uh, merit or athletic scholarships through the school, or if you get apply for outside scholarships. Um, I, I was able to get a merit based academic scholarship for Howard. And that's based um, firstly on your academic performance, but they really use your ACT and SAT scores. And I would I would recommend taking the ACT um, to I think a lot of students of color do better on the ACT. Um, and that's how I was able to get a full ride. I know it's getting very competitive <laughs> over the past five years. So I think those the the bar for getting a scholarship has gone up. But um, yeah, I think really those, those test scores, uh, unfortunately, it's not the best metric, I wouldn't say, but it is, it is the metric they use to do a lot of the scholarships. Um, but I would not, I know people that did outside scholarships. There's plenty of 
um, scholarships for HBCU students, international students, you know, there's, so there's plenty of opportunities around to, to get money because school's not cheap. All right, thank you. Um, and another question, um, how did you adjust to school in the States? How did you adjust to life at Howard coming from high school abroad, coming from ASD? What did you say? Culture shock? What, what was that transition like for you? Um, I would say, I think Doha was a great place to go before going to an HBCU because, um, you know, Howard is an HBCU in general, you know, Howard specifically is called the Mecca. It's the Mecca of uh, Black culture. So there's people from every corner of the U.S., every corner of the world coming to Howard, which I think is very similar to my experience in Doha, where uh, you're going to see every walk of life um, walking the streets in Doha. So I think um, there's no better place really to prepare you for that experience in college than um, than Qatar. It was um, it was a, it was a great next step, um, I, I think, for me. OK, beautiful. Thank you. I, I have an indication that you answered the question and, and they appreciated your response. So um, if we have any other questions, um, participants on the line can feel free to unmute if they're comfortable with that. If not, please continue to type into the chat. Um, um, Amy Grant Duncan, I did want to follow up with you about studying at a women's college. We understandably have a different community here in the, in, in, in the Middle East where there are often separation in terms of genders, and a lot of women in the Middle East might prefer to study at a, an all-women's institution. Uh, do you think that that would be something that would be attractive, especially understanding the, the social dynamics here? Do you think it would be still feel inclusive? You said that you're surrounded by other institutions that are co-ed, but do you think it would still be a comfortable space for maybe a community that feels more comfortable having some separation of gender? Absolutely, because at the end of the day, um, Spelman, you know, is was founded to educate females. And it also is very sensitive to the fact that looking at gender issues um, concerns, um, topics is very much a part of the curriculum or experience. And even though we're surrounded by other institutions, we used to laugh about it because you call it the gates, you know, the Spelman gates, um, because it do, you definitely feel like you're on a campus and there is separation, even though you have access, you could take classes at the other um, colleges and universities. And uh, Spelman, you know, welcomes women of all backgrounds, races, religion. Um, I think there is a misnomer that um, historically black colleges have only people of color attending the universities. That is not the case at all. So, um, and you have what you call um, at Spelman convocation two days out of the the week where there are specific um, topics that um, typically um, speak to something that is um, gender related, you know, because again, you are being groomed um, from that perspective of your gender. So I do think that um, it's, it would be a welcoming place, especially for women who are more comfortable um, in that setting. And I will say this too, because I forgot to mention it earlier that, um, and Russell will see this since he's a recent grad, but as a person who's, you know, going on 30 years, uh, historically black college and historically black college experience is not a four year experience. It's a lifelong experience. Um, you will be connected to your HBCU until you stop breathing. I am basically, even in Doha, you know, I will be in Atlanta for my homecoming if we have it, um, because we know that with COVID, um, a lot of the homecomings were canceled. When I was at Spelman, I made it to Howard homecoming because you did not go to an HBCU and not make it to Howard to homecoming because as Russell said, Howard is the Mecca. There is no dispute about that at all. And I made sure that I got to Howard um, at least once a year. But outside of the fun part of it, you're just so connected that you will always, your network, the network that you have is bar none. Um, 
whether it be to get, to get a job, to get advice, it's just something that stays with you. And, and um, no matter where you are, you know, even I'm on this panel because another Spelmanite, you know, here in Doha had said, you know, you should be on this panel. Um, and no matter where I've gone throughout the world. So my point is that the, another added value of going to um, an HBCU is that it sticks with you all your life and it's a gift that keeps on giving. So that's again, my plug that I wanted to, to mention. Beautiful, thank you. Um, I have one more question in the chat that is open to, to any panelists. It's not directed at any one individual, um, but HBCUs were founded on faith. They were supported by the black Christian community. Um, so attendees are interested, is there a space for Muslims in these institutions? Understanding that the black church was so instrumental in supporting um, HBCUs and they're founded on the principles of Christianity. What, what does that space look like for someone that belongs to the Muslim faith? Um, absolutely, there's a space. Um, you, you, you think about an HBCU and you think about, you know, in the United States, at the end of the day, you know, it's all creeds, it's all religions, and that's the same thing that's um, on the campus of an HBCU. In fact, I'm sure there will be coursework that you could find. You know, there's religion, um, there's a religion major at Morehouse and as well as Spelman. Of course, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, went to Morehouse. Um, so again, and it's not the, just the Christian religion. My brother is a, um, a graduate of Morehouse College. My brother is Muslim. And again, it is, um, you will feel, you will find a home within a home, You'll whether there'll be other students, where there'll be other associations, um, where there'll be programs. So, you know, Yes Spelman was founded, um, does have a Christian background, but it is not a Christian school. It's not a Jesuit, a Jesuit school. So it's not, from Spelman's standpoint, um, all religions are welcome. And, um, and I think you would find like-minded and like and other Muslims at HBCUs across the board. I would say that the same was true in my experience. Um, the Howard University Chapel, if, if you're not familiar with uh, Howard Thurman, I might look him, you might want to look him up. Um, he founded the chapel at Howard University and um, chapel at Howard University is unique because it's, it's considered interfaith. So there's not one particular faith that, um, that the technology kind of acknowledge all faiths at the Howard Chapel. Um, so there's a, we have a Muslim Student Association even within that, but um, the Howard Chapel, our services, you'll see a variety of speakers um that the university will bring in to speak and of course there's a you know long legacy uh in america of, of the christian religion and especially in terms of uh faith in the, in the black social rights movements and all that um but they do have space for uh speakers from a variety of different faiths and it really um for me was interesting to kind of deepen my understanding of religion because you're kind of seeing them all at one time. So it, it really deepened my, my own faith in being able to see and, and hear other people's experiences. Yeah, absolutely. I would just echo what uh, Amy Grant Duncan and Russell Edmonds shared. I uh, went to a predominantly white institution, but even there we had a Muslim student association. At, at every academic institution I've been to, we've had a Muslim student association. And the Muslim Student Association is, is just a group of either uh, people who identify as Muslim and people who don't, who are curious about the faith or people who are allies of the community. And they do all kinds of um, either activities or events to engage the community on campus and off of it. And also just a fun fact, there is a mosque in every single state in the United States. So this is a place that is welcoming to Muslims. As Russell mentioned, there is an interfaith um, council and community where different religions come together and have these discussions and dialogues and interactions. And also Islam goes way back in the black community as well. There is a huge community of black Muslims in the United States um, that might be different to what the experience has been in the Middle East, but it is still um, a Muslim community within the black community in the US. And I would, I would, uh, I would challenge you to look into that because it's a really interesting history and a really deep and rich one as well. Um, 
So yes, there's absolutely a space for um, the Islamic faith within HBCUs and within the United States as well. Um, thank you so much for your question. Uh, do we have any other questions? I don't see any in the chat, but I do want to give space for anyone who would like to unmute or to um, add in or, or write in a, a question before I thank the panelists. Morgan, there's a question on the Facebook Live. Oh, yeah. I don't even have yeah. that. Someone is asking um, that they didn't join college immediately after high school. Um, and is now planning to apply for college um, as an international student, is it possible? And any advice? Absolutely, it's possible. Um, um, there's no you know, age limit for when you can decide to go to uh, college or university. So it's absolutely possible. Um, you know, and I think there's always an added benefit of life experience that helps you to be a little bit more uh, focused in knowing what you want. Um, so I think that um, th that is a good thing. Um, and I think, again, to that whole point about finding individuals like you, you would find other individuals who might not have gone from high school, they might have come from a community college or they might have been working for years. Um, and you will find in most campuses that there will be within the Office of Student Affairs, you know, support um, for students that who would be, um, you know, coming in again with some time between high school and, and going to college. So I, I, I think that is, um, a, a, a wonderful thing. And I think that that's something that you should um, continue to do or, or pursue rather. And as you think about your, you know, what you want to major in or what interests you, you know, again, let that be your guide. Um, and as you look at um, whether it be universities or liberal arts colleges like um, Spelman, again, that'll help you kind of focus where you, where you want to go. But um, definitely, I, I encourage you to do that. And I'll just add that, you know, non-traditional age students really are a feature of US higher education. Um, my dad didn't go back and get his bachelor's until I was well into my 20s, 30s. I don't even know. I went to his graduation as an adult. So um, we have had, you know, when I was a student, we did have um, non-traditional age, older adults that were there or later teens that we're joining. So in terms of preparation for that, you know, starting to gauge what access you have to your high school um, documentation or you know, completion of secondary education, you wanna try to have those materials available. And then when you're looking at university options, checking for, I mean, they might have specific pages dedicated to non-traditional age students um, that can help you navigate you know, the types of classes maybe you wanna look at, um, the scheduling might be different. We've also seen that a lot of non-traditional age students um, might go through a continuing education um, course schedule where there's more evenings um, or do a full time. It, it's just, it's the range is wide and vast, um, but in terms of the application process, it would be very similar as to any student that's applying at any given time. So. Um, getting together what information you have on your academics, and then having a sense of reflection on what you've been doing since you finished high school and how those experiences between then and you applying now really are going to benefit you and have helped shape kind of what path you've decided to take and field of study you might want to um, pursue. All of those things can help you in you know, seeking admission to whichever institution you choose. And I would just add just one more bit to that, um, to Amy's point about a liberal arts college versus a, a university that is more technical driven. There may be an opportunity for you to earn college credit for your work experience. Um, so it will also shorten your length of time to obtain that degree. So again, depending on the type of school, the way it's structured, that opportunity to get college credit for the work that you've been doing and the time between high school and now is a really good option for you as well. Yeah, thank you everyone uh, for those, for that insight. I took two years off between um, high school and college 
and I did some study abroad. I did some internships. I, you know, did some work at a cafe. So <laughs> I did uh, a lot of different things between high school and college to really get um, what Amy Grant Duncan mentioned was that life experience. It really does change your perspective when you get into your university classes uh, and you have class discussions and you realize like, hey, no, this is how it works in the real world. I've actually been there for the past two years. Um, so don't discredit your experience outside of the classroom. It really does change your perspective and it makes it richer uh, and, and allows for great discussions when you get into the university setting. Um, do we have any more questions? No, that was it for the Facebook Live. Shout out to the people watching on Facebook Live too. But. <laughs> Could have been anywhere in the world tonight. Um, perfect. Okay, well, um, I will take this time to wrap up. While I'm doing closing remarks, if you have a last burning question, please feel free to interrupt. Um, we still have 15 minutes with our panelists. Uh, with that being said, thank you all so much. On behalf of the U.S. Embassy, we are so grateful to have you with us today. Um, Black History Month is really important personally and professionally, and I'm glad that we were able to have this discussion centered around historically Black colleges and universities at this time uh, during the month of February. I really appreciate your insight and really sharing your personal experiences as well as your academic ones. Um, I hope that this creates a space where we can continue to have these discussions and really welcome people to the U.S. and specifically the historically Black colleges and universities. Um, as uh, Russell and Amy Grant Duncan mentioned, these universities offer something that's really special that goes beyond your four years. As Amy said, this is until death, do us part. So you are part of a network, uh, something that is incredibly supportive. Not only are you able to find yourself, but you find community at HBCUs. So thank you to Education USA. Melissa, I'm so grateful for your, for your insight. Thank you to ASD, uh, specifically the Black Family Heritage Association, which is newly instituted. Look out for um, really interesting events. Uh, and thank you to uh, our panelists, Amy Grant Duncan, Russell Edmonds, and of course, Dr. Aaron. We really appreciate your work in your field as well. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, if you'd like to say anything, the floor is yours. Um, thank you for having me. I'm very, uh, I feel privileged to be here and to talk about my experience. I also, if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, I will make myself available. If there's anybody interested specifically in, Spel at, um, in Spelman, and also I have colleagues who've attended other universities, I would be more than happy to speak to you and also you know, connect you to those I know um, at the colleges and universities. So I am here. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Beautiful, thank you. I just wanna say thank you as well. It's been an honor and a privilege to share this panel with uh, Russell in particular. Got to meet this fine young gentleman um, right before the pandemic hit actually. Um, and Amy, it's nice to meet you as well. Um, so thank you for putting this together and the opportunity to share my experience. Um, so again, same with Amy, if you need to chat about the application process in particular, I'm available to chat with you as well. Uh, so just let me know how I can help. Beautiful. And if you do want to reach out to the panelists, feel free to reach out to the U.S. Embassy on any of our platforms and we can connect you to them. Uh, we do have their email addresses. So if you are interested in following up, let us know. Um, otherwise, thank you all for joining today. I um, trust that this was helpful in the chat. People are saying thank you. So thank you all for your time and um, happy last week, last few days of Black History Month. Uh, take advantage of it. Yes. Happy Black History Month. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Morgan. Mm.